Dr. R.T. Kendall, uh, it's a great joy and privilege to welcome you on Facing the Canon and here at Westminster Chapel, where you spent 25 years. Correct. And we'll visit that in a moment. But let's go back to the beginning. Where were you born, Artie? Ashland, Kentucky. Were you, were you born into a Christian home? Yes, yes. And would you say that you have always known the Lord? I'd never want to put it like that. At the age of six and a half, on an Easter morning, I don't know why, but I went to my parents and I was crying and I said, I want to become a Christian. And my father looked at my mother and said, we don't need to wait till we get to church. We can pray now. And we knelt at my parents' bedside and I confessed my sins to God. Now, what sins that I had committed at the age of six, I don't remember, except that I felt guilty over talking back to my parents rudely. And I confessed that to God. Um, but it was real as though it were yesterday, and I knew I was saved. And that was um, 75 years ago. Yeah. Now, did that particular decision make a difference to you at that age? I don't know. I just know that I remember it and knew that I was a Christian. Of course, over the years, uh, a lot more happened to build on that. And then it was when I was uh, 19, 20 years old that I had what I would call a Damascus Road experience. That's not quite true because it wasn't my conversion, but it was when I had an experience where the Lord Jesus was as real to me as you are at, at this moment. And that was what was really life-changing. What, what happened? I was a student at Trevecca Nazarene College, now university, and uh, only a few months before, I had, had come to the conclusion I was called to preach. And three months later, lo and behold, I'm offered a church while I'm a student. It's a little town called Palmer, Tennessee, uh, just north of Chattanooga on a mountain. And uh, I would go there on weekends, on Fridays, and come back Sunday nights and pastor the church, and Monday to Friday was a student at Trevecca. One Monday morning, as it turned out, I came back on a Monday that time, and I remember it was about 6.30 in the morning. On my way back, I had an hour and a half more to drive. I turned off my radio, decided I would pray all the way back. I'd never done that before, I usually I'd play the radio, but for some reason I wanted to pray. I felt a heaviness. Uh, a burden, and I couldn't understand what it meant. And I began to plead with the Lord, what's going on? Am, am I not saved? Uh, when all of a sudden, two scriptures came to my mind. One was 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The other, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light, Matthew eleven thirty. But I thought, my yoke is not easy, it's heavy. Please help me, Lord, help me to cast my care upon you. Then I can say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I can take you to this spot on the road on old US 41 at the bottom of Mott Eagle toward Manchester. There was, as I'm driving, Jesus interceding for me at the right hand of God. It was as real as I'm looking at you. And I, I couldn't believe it. I burst into tears. And I never felt such love. And he, he loves me more than I love myself. And he was behind it all. He was praying to the Father as if to plead in my case. I could not tell what he was saying. It's like if you hear somebody in the next room, you can hear voices, but you don't know what they're saying. But about an hour later, when I get to heaven, I want to get a video replay and just see all that happened in that hour because yes. I don't know. I know that an hour later, I heard Jesus say to the Father, He wants it. Voice answered back, I take it to be the Father answering Jesus, He can have it. And in that moment, 
I felt a surge of warmth go into my chest. I mean, it was physical. It was, it was warm. I, I immediately thought of, of John Wesley, his Aldersgate experience, where he said, my, I felt my heart strangely, strangely warm. Yeah. I wondered if it was much the same thing as what John Wesley experienced. All I know is my heart was warm. I had a peace unlike anything I've ever had. I didn't know you could have anything like that. It wasn't just the absence of anxiety. It was a presence of a powerful peace, rest, just rest. And then for maybe 30 seconds, I saw the face of Jesus looking at me. If I were an artist with perfect recall, I could tell you what he looked like, at least this part. Look at me, languid eyes, tenderly, and then I find myself at Trevecca. I pull into the parking lot. I remember it was about 10 minutes to eight, five minutes to eight. I go to my room, shave, go to the first class, and I thought, what was that? What was that? A friend of mine who was next door in my dormitory came across the campus. He said, what has happened to you? I said, well, something has. He said, I know. What is it? I said, I don't know. I just know one thing. I'm saved. He said, that's a strange thing to say. Of course you're saved. You don't understand, Bill. His name was Bill Kearns. Of course you're saved. I said, no, Bill. I'm eternally saved. What do you mean by that? I know I will go to heaven when I die, no matter what I do between now and then. I've been to heaven. I'm going back. Nothing could stop it. Well, you don't need to say that. I mean, you're going to change your mind on that. I knew then I would never change. There's no way to calculate experience to explain how real it was, how deep it was. I knew I was eternally saved. Now, I look back, as I become more theological, what was it? Was it the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Yes, I think so. I think it's the rest of faith in Hebrews 4. Uh, I don't think it was my conversion. Uh, but I know that within 24 hours, my theology changed completely. And I thought I discovered something new. And I thought maybe I'm the first since the Apostle Paul to <laughs> receive this. Yes. And so over the years, I've tried to interpret what happened to me. And uh, that's just kind of the short story. Now, that obviously had a deep impact into your life. Yes. And how did that change you, that particular experience? Totally. First of all, uh, for roughly 10 months, you'll wonder why not 11, 12, or 10 years, but for some 10 months, I had a conscious presence of God nonstop for 10 months. During that time, I also had visions, 10, 11, 12 visions. And uh, uh, my theology completely changed. Uh, I was assistant to the dean of religion. And he said, RT, uh, you're going off into Calvinism. I said, what's that? Well, we don't believe that. Well, I said, we're wrong. He said, well, don't leave us. I said, I didn't say I was going to leave. I, I said, I know that, that God has in his elect from the foundation of the world. And, oh, R.T., don't say that. I said, let me read this to you in Romans 9. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. You explain that, Dr. Greathouse. He said, give me some time on that. Well, that was 60 years ago. And uh, in the meantime, I began to see that what I had tapped into by experience was nothing new. It's called Reformed Theology. And uh, that's how it came, came about. And uh, it also would mean I wasn't going to stay a Nazarene the rest of my life. And I was pretty sure of that. Uh, but I didn't know exactly what I would be doing. Uh, but that, it certainly changed my life. Changed your life. You, you then came to Oxford and um, studied at Oxford University. Well, that's no, many, that's what, 35 years later. Uh, well, no, not 35. That was 
15 years later. What did you study at Oxford? Theology. Um, I studied the English Puritans, and I would read uh, Calvin and all the Puritans, and uh, my thesis was going to be on the nature of saving faith from William Perkins to the Westminster Assembly, but uh, I had to put that on a Calvinistic foundation because Perkins called himself a Calvinist. And so I had to read Calvin more than I'd ever done in my life. I had never read a word of Calvin, by the way, until uh, years after that experience I've just described. I, did, yes. I knew nothing about Calvinism. Uh, but then I began to read Calvin. Then I'd read the Puritans, and I'd read the Calvin, and then I'd read Puritans. I thought, they're different. They're just different as they can be. And that became my thesis, in what sense the Puritans really followed Calvin. And uh, they gave me a DPhil for it. Now, you've been reading the Bible, studying the Bible, what, from the age of six? Yep. Um, and you're passionate about the Bible. How do you know that that is the Word of God? The internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's Calvin's language, and he would give me those words, but that explains it. In fact, when I was ordained, uh, years later, uh, Dr. N. Burnett Magruder interviewed me in front of 300 people, and he wanted me to know the difference between ways you can come to understand Scripture. He says there's the external proof and the internal proof. Well, the external proof would be through critical approach to the Bible, archaeology, testimonies of great men, things like that. But then there's the internal proof, and that is the witness of the Spirit. And it was the immediate witness of the Spirit that made, made me know that this was the infallible Word of God. What that experience did for me is to drive me to Scripture like I'd never read Scripture in my life. And whereas before, I would read it defensively, having to prove my doctrine, because I was brought up a certain way, and I would have to prove my doctrine. After that experience, I didn't want to read it defensively, I just wanted to see what it said. And I would take wherever it led me. And it turned out it led me away from the way I was brought up. Okay, you've been studying it for many decades. Uh, are, are there still books of the Bible that you struggle with that you don't understand? There are, yeah, the book of Revelation for a start. Um, so, I, uh, so what do you make of the book of Revelation? Well, when I was 19 years old, I understood it perfectly. <laughs> Uh, today, I can just take bits and pieces that I think I know what it means, uh, but I would not go to the stake for my eschatology. Uh, I have some strong convictions that I think I'm right on some of it, uh, but yeah, I would not claim to understand the book of Revelation. I don't know whether I'm a pre, post, or ah or pan. Yeah. I've been right once because I've believed everything you can believe, and, uh, but I'm not sure when. Now, um, the phrase, having a quiet time, um, of spending time with the Lord uh, in prayer and in Scripture, could you just let us in on how do you personally do it on a daily basis? Forty years ago, Dr. Mark Lloyd-Jones introduced me to a Bible reading plan uh, designed by Robert Murray McShane. And uh, until then, I did not have a plan. I would just go to the Bible and, and read two or three chapters and then, you know, the next day. And, and I'm ashamed that for years that was the way it was. But uh, I can now say to you, J. John, that I've read the Bible through at least 40 times. Uh, the New Testament 80 times, the Psalms 80 times, and I do that to this day. Uh, for some reason, and I, can, I cannot tell you why, but from my earliest days, even when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, I had a prayer life. Uh, when I was a high school student in Ashland, Kentucky, I would spend 15 minutes every morning on my knees and 15 minutes before I go to bed at night on my knees, combined with reading the scriptures. 
for some reason I've always done it. I don't know why. I think, well, my earliest memory of my dad was seeing him on his knees for 30 minutes every morning before he went to work. He wasn't a minister. He, was, he, was, uh, he worked for the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway. Mm. He was a rate clerk, or clerk, you'd say. And he went to work, but never without spending 30 minutes on his knees. I thought that was normal. I did that. And then when I become pastor of a church, I find that nobody's doing it. <laughs> and then over the years, I find out that most preachers don't yeah. pray that much. There are preachers, J. John, yes. who don't read their Bibles. They only go to the Bible when they need a sermon. And there are preachers that don't have a prayer life. A, a, a poll was taken 18, 19 years ago that showed us what the average church leader does in his personal life. They answered questions anonymously, you know, describing what is your view of the Holy Spirit, what is your doctrine, a lot of questions. The average church leader in Britain and America spends four minutes a day in their quiet time. And you wonder, why the church is powerless. Martin Luther, two hours a day. John Wesley, two hours a day. And the whole time, virtually, that I was at Westminster Chapel, it was two hours a day for me. And, and I probably a little less than that in my retirement, but never less than an hour a day. And uh, this is just the way I'm wired. Sure. And I, and I find, to my surprise, not everybody's like that. So why, why do you think, uh most of us uh, don't take having a quiet time with God seriously. You tell me. Uh, the last year I was here, I was yeah. invited by the Evangelical Alliance to address uh, 100 ministers at a meeting. It was held at, held at HTB, and 100 ministers from London there, and they gave me 10 minutes to speak on the subject of prayer. So I used the 10 minutes to persuade those 100 ministers to Please spend one hour a day, one hour a day in quiet time. Well, you know, they, they came up to me after and thanked me, you know, well-known ministers, wrote me letters, and I wouldn't have missed that for anything. Let me know that they appreciated it. Sure. They just hadn't been instructed. You would have thought that seminary, Bible college, wherever, they would instill this. Uh, so as I say, honestly, I don't know why I'm that way. I do know this, there was a preacher that I admired as I grew up as a teenager. I loved his preaching, and I found out that they said that he would spend six, seven, eight hours a day in prayer. Now, for some reason, that gripped me. And I've always felt this is the key. And uh, this is just the way I've been. I'm not taking any credit for it. I was just trained that way. I, why I would admire that preacher, I don't know. But uh, that's the best answer I can give you. Just uh, help us to understand a little bit about prayer. If, if God knows what we need, why do we have to ask him? Because he told us to. You see, that's, that's his kind way. Uh, he knew that Abraham would sacrifice Isaac. He knew that he would. But then he said, now I know you love me. He knew that before, but he did it. He, it's called language of accommodation. Of course he knows everything, but he wants us... Look, you put it best to me. Do you remember in the vestry? You used to come to see me two or three times yes. a year for a couple of hours. And one day you came and said, RT, I've just got back from India. I tell this story all over yes. the world. And can I tell it to you now, you in case may. you've forgotten? <laughs> you tell said, it. I've, here's what I tell. Yes. And you correct me where I've got it sure. wrong. Sure. RT, you won't believe what I've seen. I've seen miracles. I've seen blind people healed. Yes. Arms outstretched. I said, I talk to me. He says, I feel like a fraud. Nobody's going to believe me. As I would preach, they told me before I got up, now, when the miracles start, J. John, don't worry, we know what to do. 
Yes. And you said to them, what do you mean? Well, don't worry, there'll be miracles. Because wherever that was, I'd love to know where that was because I'd like to go back there. But you said, honestly, as I preached the gospel, I watched it. I could just see arms outstretched before my eyes all over the place. But then what I'm coming up to, you kept hearing about a Sister Teresa. That's right. Not Mother Teresa. No, Sister, Sister Teresa, who had unusual words of knowledge. Yes. And uh, you said, well, I'd like to meet her. Well, they said, maybe. Well, a day or so later, they bring this little lady to you, and they say, J. John, this is Sister Teresa. <laughs> this is so funny. I'm telling him the story. <laughs> and, uh, but this is what you told me. It I mean, I've, I've told it literally on every continent yeah. on the planet, and don't tell me now it's not true. <laughs> So, no, so she comes Teresa. up to you and, and you say, Sister Teresa, yes. Teresa, I've heard a lot about you, uh, that you get words, and if, if God were to show you anything, I'd be grateful. And you said she turned around and walked away, and you thought you had offended her. She comes back 45 minutes later with a list. 13 things on the list, number one, number two. And these were things that only you knew. Yes. She could not have known. And then she comes to number 13 and says, by the way, God likes your company. He wants two hours of your time every day. Goodbye, and you never saw her again. <laughs> now, that is true. Now, you see, I, that, that story confirmed me, because I don't know that I told you at that time, and I told you tonight, I hope, hope I haven't said anything I shouldn't, but that's how long I prayed. Yeah. The whole time I was at Westminster Chapel. And, and you said to me, RT, I'm going to do it. And uh, I've also told this, tell me I've got this wrong, that after that time it made a difference in your own ministry. A you began to difference. see revival break out in various places. I did. And uh, I remember reading on the front page of the Times about what happened at Bristol Cathedral yes. and other places. That was post Sister Teresa. Yes, so was. it made a difference in your own ministry. It did. We, we, we believe in Jesus, we believe in prayer. So did I, uh, the story you got that it right. you told me, I told it back, just yeah, exactly right. Exactly as it okay, was. Okay, well, I'll keep telling it. Sister <laughs> Teresa, you go to Oxford, you graduate from Oxford. What did you then do? Well, I w was invited to preach in this place, and uh, I wasn't expecting anything from this. Uh, it was an honor, and uh, I accepted the invitation. <laughs> this is terrible. Probably just so that when I go back to America, I could say I preached here once. <laughs> uh, that's not a very spiritual reason. Uh, uh, and by the way, Martin Lloyd Jones had nothing to do with this. People think that it was the doctor uh, who caused me to be invited. That's not the way it was. The truth is, uh, uh, somebody else who had heard me preach at my little Southern Baptist church near Oxford, a lot of people don't know this, but in the days when the Upper Hayford Air Force thrived, you had yes. U.S. airmen there, and they wanted their little church. And they needed a pastor, so while I was at Regents Park College at Oxford, I was pastor of this little church. And uh, by the way, Dr. Lloyd-Jones would preach for me every year, and that's when we got to be known. But he never thought of me coming here. He saw me as an academic uh, professor one day, theology, and uh, Mr. E. H. Padden, who just died a couple months ago, yeah. he was the church secretary here, was told by someone who had heard me at uh, Hayford, you ought to get an R.T. Kendall to just preach for you one Sunday. So Mr. Patton called Dr. Lloyd-Jones and said, we were told we should have an R.T. Kendall one Sunday. And according to Ernie Patton, verbatim was, have him. Theologian, you know, but have him. And that was it. Well, they had me. And at the end of the day, the deacons asked to see me. And all 12 marched into the vestry where you and I were yes. here 45 minutes ago. I said, am I in trouble? <laughs> no. Sir Fred Catherwood took the lead. He says, 
we want you to stay. I said, what do you mean? Give us six months. Well, at that time, I was waiting to have my Viva at Oxford. Yes. And we'd already sent everything back to America. My son's new bicycle, my books, souvenirs, clothes, everything. All we had was living out of suitcases. And uh, so I'd go home and say to Louise, they, they want us to come here. And the next day, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and his wife, Bethan, drove to see us with the intention of persuading me to come here for six months. His words were, you have nothing to lose. You need to get out of Oxford. You need to get out of that academic atmosphere uh, and just preach here for six months. I said, well, doctor, what if they want me to stay? Because, you know, we're, we're, we're going to go back to America. He said, I told them you wouldn't stay. Are you saying that if I come and I don't stay, they're not going to be angry? No, it's fine. You, you just come. Well, I said, Louise, what do you think? Well, we came. Well, after being here two or three months, people came, came back to the vestry one after another and said, please don't leave. <laughs> please don't leave. And then they asked, could they vote on me? And I said to Louise, what do you think? What if we stay a year? And they voted, uh, got 92% of the vote. And Dr. Lloyd-Jones later uh, said that's a better vote than I'd have got, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. And, uh, and, but here is one other little ingredient, not a small thing. He had never heard me preach. He came in one Sunday when I didn't know he was there, sat way in the back, on the back row behind a post so nobody could see him. And they told me after the service, the doctor was here. Really? He called me that night. His opening words were, you're a preacher. You're a born preacher. Your place is not in a university. It's in the pulpit. And he let that word go out. And that word just went everywhere. So Dr. Lloyd-Jones later said to me, I and I alone put you there. Yes. Because he let people know that he approved of me. So you and came for six months and stayed 25 years. That's it, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you taught the scriptures. That was, I mean, amongst many other things that you did. And you would teach through the books of the Bible. We well, see, this is the interesting thing. It was Dr. Lloyd-Jones who taught me how to preach. Uh, back in 1963, a friend by the name of Ernie Riesinger sent me Dr. Lloyd-Jones's volumes on the Sermon on the Mount. And I began to read them. And I was transformed. I said, this is the greatest book I've ever read in my life. I wrote him a letter. He wrote me back. I'd write him. He'd write me back. And then we eventually met at Winona Lake, Indiana. And he signed my book uh, in Winona Lake in Indiana. That would have been in 1963. And I, I said, this book, I wrote it. I wrote uh, on, on the inside cover is the greatest book I've ever read. It's transformed my preaching. And from that moment, I began to preach in an expository fashion. I'd never done it before. But I, I just copied him in a, in a way, as best as I could. Never dreamed that one day, one day, in fact, you know, I told you we'd send all our books back to America. Yeah. Well, after I agreed to stay, they'd have sent them all back here. And I'm opening boxes of books. And I come to the Sermon on the Mount and open it up. And there's his signature with warmest greetings at Winona Lake. And I got on the phone. I said, Dr. Lloyd-Jones, guess what I'm looking at right now? I said, do you remember when we met at Winona Lake? He said, I remember it very well. Would you have thought mm -hmm. that one day I would be in your pulpit? And he said, it is marvelous in our eyes. Yes. And I've just never got over that. Never got over it. No. And uh, where were we? During those, uh, well, not just the 25 years, but many years, 
uh, you've highlighted or focused on certain themes. Uh, one theme in particular is total forgiveness. What, what prompted you uh, to teach, preach, and to write about that? The 25 years in this place, to quote uh, Charles Dickens, they were the best of times, they were the worst of times. It wasn't easy here. And we went through, Louise and I, what was at the time the most difficult moment we'd ever had. Don't ask for details because I'm not going to tell you more. Sure. But an old friend from Romania, his name is Joseph Zone, happened to be in London. And I couldn't tell anybody what had happened, but I told him, fully expecting him, this is what I wanted, to put his arm around me and said, RT, you ought to be angry. Get it out of your system. That, that's what I was hoping because I think I was telling him this so that he could sympathize and all that. He just said, anything more? I said, no, that's it. He said, give me 15 minutes, I need to take a nap. I said, don't do that, you're, you're, you're gonna sleep for two hours. He said, I'll be back in 15 minutes, give me a cup of tea, have it ready for me. Well, I made him a cup of tea and uh, 15 minutes to the second, here he was. He said, I told you I'd be back. And uh, he said, he, he tasted the tea because it got hard and overdone and it was cold and he took a sip. He said, that's what I call a cup of tea. Now, our tea. You must totally forgive them. For until you totally forgive them, you will be in chains. Release them, and you will be released. Nobody has ever talked to me like that in my life. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I said, Joseph, I can't. He said, you can and you must. If I can narrow these 25 years in London down to those 15 minutes, they turn out, J. John, to be my finest hour. That moment changed my life in almost direct proportion to what I described earlier when I saw the face of Jesus. This was a new, it was an epoch-making moment. I was never to be the same again. And so in the meantime, I'd written several books, and uh, my publisher said, what do you want to do next? I said, I think, I think I want to write a book on forgiveness, and I'd like to call it Total Forgiveness, because those were Joseph Zone's words. Yes. You must totally, totally forgive them. And that gripped me. In the meantime, I had preached through the life of Joseph, which yeah. became a book called God Meant It For Good. And uh, there's a chapter in that book on forgiveness. And, but then my book, Total Forgiveness, was an elaboration. And uh, lo and behold, it's turned out to be my bestseller. And it's in, I think, 20 languages, Japanese, Chinese, Russian. I wouldn't have thought it, but it's gone right all over the world. RT, what happens if we don't forgive? other people who've hurt us? Well, you cut off your anointing, if I put it that way, but not really. God never deserts us. But you can quench the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus said, if you forgive not men their trespasses, your Father will not forgive yours, He's not talking about losing your salvation. And thank God He's yes. not saying that or who would be saved. But He's talking about the fellowship with the Father. You see, the Lord's Prayer was given that we might understand the kingdom. It's right couched in the Sermon on the Mount. And then at the end of the Lord's Prayer, He says, if you forgive not men their trespasses, which shows that's the main reason for the Lord's Prayer. If I don't forgive, 
I will grieve the Holy Spirit and as a consequence forfeit a conscious awareness of His presence. I, for, I forfeit that. I forfeit it. And this is just the way it's turned out with me, J. John. If, if I have any bitterness in my heart, I can't prepare a sermon. If, I, if, if, Lu, if Louise and I uh, have an argument, uh, can I tell you this story? Yes, go ahead. When I was pastor of this church, I started my Sunday morning preparation on Monday morning. Now, Dr. Lloyd-Jones didn't have to do that. You need to know something about this man. He had an intellect that comes around, I would say, not just once a century, maybe once every 500 years. He's a Michelangelo, Da Vinci, that kind of intellect. And uh, he, he could probably start preparing on a Saturday and be brilliant on Sunday. I couldn't do that. I just start on a Monday and work all week. It only happened once in 25 years. It was now Saturday morning. I hadn't cracked a book. All I managed to do was to keep up my Robert Murmick Shane Bible reading because I was preaching all over Britain, seeing people. And it was now Saturday morning. And I was in a state of panic. I thought, Lord, please help me. You know, you know that this has been a hard week. Please, in mercy, help me. This, this day, compensate for these five days I've lost. It was 9 o'clock in the morning. I thought, good, I've got a whole day. Just maybe the Lord will help me. At that moment, Louise and I got into an argument. Do you know the word dandy yes. over here? It was a dandy. It was a dandy. It didn't go well. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you. Yeah. She was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I go, I slam the door, go to my room, open my Bible, see, Lord, give me something for tomorrow. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> deal with that woman. <laughs> Blank sheet of paper, now 11 o'clock, nothing, nothing. Lord, please help me. Noon, blank sheet of paper, 1 o'clock, blank sheet of paper, 2 o'clock, nothing. I said, Lord, you know that what I preach tomorrow will go all over the world. You've got to help me. Silence. Silence. Except a faint voice, I recall, it sounded like this, really. <laughs> Three o'clock, four o'clock. You see, I was waiting for her. At four o'clock, I go into the kitchen. I can see her now standing by the refrigerator. She was tearful. I said, honey, I'm sorry. It was all my fault. Well, it wasn't all your fault. It was partly my fault. No, it's all my fault. And I'm so sorry. We kissed. We hugged. J. John, I promise you, I went back to the same blank sheet of paper, same scripture. In 45 minutes, I had everything I needed for Sunday. I could not write the thoughts fast enough. They just poured in. I would write as fast as I could. And I thought after 45 minutes, I got my sermon. This is it. So, the moral of the story is? <laughs> you ask, what happens when you don't forgive? Yes. In my case, I cannot answer for anybody else. I can't even prepare a sermon. I can't do it. Some could. I, I know preachers, they're so brilliant. They don't need the anointing. But, uh, but it creates blockages. That's, you said it best. You keep going, yeah, and that's good. No. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've uh, written and spoken on numerous subjects. Um, another is on tithing. 
you believe that followers of Jesus should tithe. Could you explain that? Sure. The funny thing was, after I was here a month or two, uh, in that six month period, and I could tell the different ones are wanting me to stay. So I began to think of every subject that they might not agree with that I would preach during this six months so that if they did call me and I did agree, they couldn't say, you didn't, we didn't know you believed that or we wouldn't have called you. So I preached everything I could think of that they wouldn't like. And one of them was tithing and uh, did something that I believe. Again, my father taught me to tithe and I, uh, I grew up in the same way he taught me to have a prayer life. And, uh, and what, uh, can you explain what tithe means? Okay. Well, let's just assume you know nothing, and I'll teach you right now. Yes, please. All right. First, tithe means one-tenth. And the Bible says the tithe is the Lord's. It's His. And so what He wants you to do is to live on 90% of your income. And if you live on 90% of your income, uh, my dad used to say it'll go as far as the 100%. In fact, he'd say, son, I think it goes further. And so I, I lived that way over the years. And when I came to Britain, I began to notice that, that British Christians generally don't tithe. There's some exceptions, but generally they just don't tithe. And I believed in it, and I decided I'd preach it. And it, it upset a few people, uh, but they called me knowing that. And uh, so I, I preached it here faithfully for 25 years. And uh, then I called my publisher. And, uh, you know, I don't pu call my publisher uh, to say I want to write a book. They, they ask me, but I made an exception. I called Hodder and Stoughton. I say I want to write a book on tithing. Silence. <laughs> Hello? Did you say you wanted to write a book on tithing? Yep. We'll get back to you. A week later, Dr. Kendall, if we were to agree to publish your book on tithing, will you buy a thousand copies? <laughs> yes. Okay, we'll do it. They were convinced it would be a financial failure, and they just wanted to get their money back for the printing. Well, I got Billy Graham, John Stott, Sir Fred Catherwood. Eventually, uh, George Carey came along. The book is still in print. They changed the sub, uh, title a few years ago. To, they call it over here, The Gift of Giving. I, I, I didn't want them to do that. I don't think it did any good. I wish I could get the rights back and call it tithing again. But it's still in print. In America, it's gone through 40 printings, several languages, and uh, what more do you want to know? What happens if we don't tithe? Well, there won't be thunder and lightning, and hopefully not too much, because <laughs> most Christians don't. They don't. Uh, and I don't say that if you do, you'll be driving a Bentley three weeks from now. Uh, but I do take this line, that when you consider these words, I knew I brought my Bible here for something. Uh, even though Malachi wrote during the parenthetical period of the law, 1300 years, even though this was during that time, he didn't have to say this because under the law you had to. You see, tithing began with Abraham 400 years before the law came in. He was the first tither. The patriarchs were tithers. And so uh, the law is completed when Jesus died on the cross. So it takes us back to Abraham. Abraham tithed voluntarily out of gratitude. And that's what I teach. But here's the interesting thing. Even during that period under the law, here's what Malachi said. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. In fact, the authorized version says, prove me herewith and see if I will not pour out the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. That's under the law. He didn't have to do that because they were supposed to. Well, tithing was an assumption in the New Testament. And uh, my book, Tithing, goes into the whole business about the law 
and the gospel. And uh, all I can say is you can't outgive the Lord. And I don't say it's going to make you wealthy, but it's not going to hurt you. And people who live on 90% over a period of years only have God to thank. And by the way, when uh, we retired and uh, they had a farewell service for me here. You were there. You spoke. You went through the alphabet. I spoke. Now, you did. <laughs> and Lyndon Bowring, my close friend, was, was chairman. Yes. Well, uh, on that night, uh, people said goodbye because, you know, it was going <laughs> to... It was supposed to be like my funeral service if I wanted to know what they'd be saying about me at my memorial service. So I sat down in the front row and heard you and, uh, and Fred Catherwood and Richard Buse and Sandy Miller, others. And uh, then after the service, people would come by and say goodbye. You would not believe how many would say, by the way, thank you for teaching us to tithe. Yeah, so that's the best way I can put it in, in a minute or two. What would, you, with the experience that, and the wisdom that you've gained, uh, if you met the young 25-year-old R.T. Kendall, what advice would you give him? Well... I would first urge him to have a quiet time devotional life like we've been talking about tonight. I would say, whoever you are, one hour a day alone with God. Uh, let your 20 minutes of Bible reading, because that's how long it takes if you're going to read the Bible through in a year. It takes 15 or 20 minutes a day to read the Bible. Have a prayer list. I mean, I have a prayer list. You're on it. You've been on it for 15, 20 years. Are there possibly people here? I don't know. I can't see who's here. That uh, I pray for every day. And I would, I, would, I would first focus on his personal life. To be a man of prayer. Know your Bible. And know your Bible very, very well. Know it better than you know anything. And I would urge him never, ever cave in to the critical approach, approach to Scripture. Uh, I believe in the infallibility of Scripture. And by the way, I've been trained by those who believed in form criticism, redaction criticism, studied under Bultmann, Bart, Bruner. I was trained by them, but I came through it. And I'm more convinced in the infallibility of Scripture than I've ever been. So I would say to that young 25-year-old, if you stick to the Bible... You'll be fine. Depart from it. You'll become yesterday's man in a very short period of time. That would be what I would say. Now, I would urge them, if they have the gift, to preach in an expository manner. I don't want to be unfair. Not all have that gift. Yes. And there are those who are topical preachers and, and so forth. Uh, but that's what I do. And I would urge them to try that. And, uh, but mainly stick to scripture and then I would urge this be a soul winner and be willing to talk to anybody about Jesus now I don't know whether to start this you can stop me but uh, the best decision I made in 25 years next to my total forgiveness experience was having Arthur Blessed here yes and uh, he's the man who's carried across around the world. He started our pilot light ministry. Well, I did under his sort of leadership. And I was on a TV program with him a couple, oh, it's been three or four years ago now. We were talking about my book, Elijah. I've written a book called These Are the Days of Elijah. And he's interviewing me. And in the course, he said, RT, you know, Elisha wanted Elijah's mantle. Do you have people coming up to you and asking you for your, your anointing? Do you ever have, what do you say to them when they come up to you and they say they want your anointing? I said, Arthur, I did that to you. Don't you remember? 
Remember in the vestry, we got down on our knees. I asked you to lay hands on me that I could have your anointing. Yeah, I do remember that. I remember that very well. Then he started to go to something else. I said, stop, wait, wait. Was that prayer answered? Yes. Yes. I hadn't thought of it till that minute. He started to cry. And it, it was all on live TV. It wasn't planned at all. And do you know something? I realized that days after Arthur prayed that way for me, I felt the burden out on the steps of Westminster Chapel to start our pilot light ministry. We just talked to pastors by, whoever they are. I did it for 20 years. I personally was out there every Saturday for 20 years. And it's changed my life, whether on an airplane, on the tube, in a barber shop, I talked to anybody about Jesus. I never did that before. I thought, preaching the gospel from the pulpit, I've done my bit. It's easier to preach to a thousand than it is to talk to one other person. But through Arthur Blessed's influence, I became an evangelist. So that said, I would say to this 25-year-old, be an evangelist. Make sure you don't lose sight. People need to be saved. They need the gospel. And I'm hoping you're going to ask me, why do they need the gospel? RT, why do they need the gospel? <laughs> Glad you asked. <laughs> My next book, I'm going to start writing it any day, be out within a year. I'm going to call it, Whatever Happened to the Gospel? Yes. And the key part of, of the book will be, why be a Christian? Why be a Christian? It'd be interesting to pass a sheet of paper around it. And everybody write down why you think your neighbor should be a Christian, why your loved ones. And uh, you hear people say, well, if there were no heaven, there were no hell, I'd still be a Christian. Don't tell that to the Apostle Paul. He said, we're miserable. We're, we're be pitied if that's what we believe. It's not existential. It's not what it does for you. And here's the thing. Romans 1.16 Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Yes. It's the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. He might have said, it's the power of God for healing. Paul believed in healing. But that's not what he said. He could have said, I believe in the gospel of the kingdom. He believed in the kingdom. But that's not what he said. He might have said, it's the power of God for signs and wonders. He believed in signs and wonders. But what he said, it's the power of God for salvation. And then two verses later, he tells you why. It's in verse 18. The Greek word is gar, for, because the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. J. John, yes. the reason people need to be saved is because there's a hell. There is a hell. And because of that, the first message of the New Testament, John the Baptist, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And preaching like that made him come all the way from Jerusalem. And today, people are afraid to preach it. They think they're going to empty their congregation. Yeah. Well, all I can say is, this is what I believe. This is what I go to the stake for. I believe in heaven. I believe in hell. And Martin Luther called John 3.16, the Bible in a nutshell, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, a reference to hell, but have everlasting life. And they must believe this gospel. And I think the reason that evangelism has diminished, that people don't believe in eternal punishment anymore, I do. The future, RT. What are your hopes? I know you're writing a, a book about the gospel, but what are your, are there still things you want to do? Well, if I keep my health, I'm, I'll be 82 in July. Looking good. Thank you. Very good. I paid you to say that. Yeah. <laughs> you are looking good. 
I, I can't make anything happen. I would love in my old age to see what I didn't see here. You see, if I've got it right, and that's a big if, my latest book, or one of the latest, is called Prepare Your Heart for the Midnight Cry. You kind of gave a nice uh, blurb for it. If I've got it right, the next thing to happen on God's calendar is not the second coming of Jesus, but the awakening of the church just before. Yes. And I told you at, uh, an hour ago, or whenever we started, that I had visions for about 10 months. Uh, one or two of those visions indicated that there would be a revival that would go right around the world. And the message was, Jesus is coming soon. And the amazing thing was, in the vision, people believed it. They believed it. They don't believe it now. You go out there and say that, they'll laugh you to scorn. But something would happen that would turn everything around. And people would be scared to death that it's real. It would be a return of the fear of God. And that is what will awaken the church. That's what I think is coming next. I'd like to think that I'll still be alive to see it. So that would be my hope. Other than that, just preach until I can't walk and write until I can't think. And then to be welcomed home to glory. Artie, you, um, you are an inspiration. I love it the way that you love God, that you love Jesus, that you long to keep in step with his spirit. And uh, I love it the way that you love the Holy Scriptures. And um, you've uh, inspired us tonight. And uh, you've infused in us uh, faith, hope and love. And we, we thank you for your life, uh, your ministry, uh, all that you've done, all that you're doing, and uh, the way that you keep on doing it. We thank you, Dr. Artie Kendall.